Hello all. I'm so excited to introduce to you this next panel, which explores the role of everyday creativity in transforming communities. And in particular, how each of the organizations represented supports and instigates the creative power of the communities they're embedded in. Please welcome Kemi Ilesami, Executive Director of the Laundromat Project. <laughs> Ebony, Ebony Noel Golden, founder and CEO of Betty's Daughter Arts Collaborative. And Shade Lipkot, CEO of the National Black Theater. Um, I'm so excited to have this chance to connect with you all here on stage and in front of our beautiful audience. Hey, y'all. Hey. Hello. Y'all still with us? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's been a really exciting roller coaster, and we're ready to take it to um, another exploration. Um, that, in particular, what I'm excited about this next panel is that we're privileging the perspective of community engagement and everyday creativity. So I wanted to open up with this idea that Robin Kelly and others have written and talked about, which is this notion of radical imagination and how essential it is for liberation. Because um, not only does it allow us to resist oppressive institutions, but it actually allows us to envision what we want to replace those institutions with. Um, so I want to open it up with this, with this concept and to ask each of you or whoever wants to jump in, I know our time is short, how does this notion of radical imagination connect to the idea of art and creativity and how is this reflected in the work that you do every day? Look at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been inspired today by the James Baldwin quotes and thinking about literature and some of the other things that others have brought up so far this morning. So I looked up a, a quote from The Salt Eaters, the opening of Salt Eaters by Tony K. Mm -hmm. Bambara that I wanted to share that I go back to as a touch point. And it's, I'll connect it. So the book opens up with, are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? Just so you're, just so you're sure, sweetheart, and ready to be healed. Because wholeness is no trifling matter. Mm. A whole lot of weight when you're well. And um, I really think a lot about the Laundromat Project's work as building a culture and a community of wellness and owning our imaginations in its most radical form is about that pursuit of being well um, and being able to sit in every complexity and nuance and contradiction and, and joy and beauty that we uh, deserve to hold. We serve communities of color, um, communities living on modest income right here in New York City. Uh, we're building a community of artists and neighbors um, at, who are using creativity as a, um, a path towards wellness and towards um, creating change in, in the places where they live and where they grow and where they breathe and where they raise families and all, the, all of those beautiful things. And they're doing it, we're doing it by uh, uh, supporting artist projects that are community engaged and community responsive. We're working with artists that want to do this work with a moral compass, with respect for the communities in which they are taking a part, um, et cetera. And we have a community hub in the South Bronx where we get to go again and again and again, and I think that'll come up in some of our conversation, but this idea of being well for me is very rooted to the ideal of radical wellness yeah. and imagination. Yeah, I, um, I'm feeling in this moment um, that radical imagination is the only way we can um, be visionary and future forward and how we want this world to look um, in the now and in the liberated Afro future. And there is a, a song by Bernice Johnson Regan that happens at the beginning of um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, the, the film version. The song is, um, there's a new world coming, everything's going to be turning over, everything's going to be turning, where are you going to be standing when it comes? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, being in a practice of of radical imagination means I am learning how to choose where I want to stand. Um, do I want to stand still? Do I want to stand scared? Do I want to stand afraid? Do I want to stand with folks who are pushing for that new world? Um, and 
and art and radical imagination, I just, I think it can be interchangeable. Uh, for me, it is interchangeable, and it really um, provides the foundation for my work as an artist, as an educator, as a strategist, um, working with communities and working with organizations that are supporting the absolute necessity for artists to be a, at decision makers at all levels and um, parts of our communities. Um, and right now, um, the pictures that you see are from a work of love and a work of um, art that I've been able to bring this idea of radical imagination into 125th and Freedom, mm -hmm. uh, which is my most current performance project, public art project, that traveled from First Avenue to, um, to all the way west, um, um, Riverside, not Riverside, uh, what's the, where did we go, Kimmy, you came. It was a park, Riverside Park. It was park. a park, River, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> in a, in a five-hour durational performance piece that was really looking at how we can reimagine um, our communities and be um, creatively a part of those conversations around change, around legacy, and around public space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, radical imagination. So, for me, radical imagination starts with our psychic shackles and the commitment to disappear them. And mm -hmm. it's something that we practice at National Black Theater, um, which for me is a game changer. It's something that I call the over under mm -hmm. factor. So what's the over under factor? Immediately, ASAP, get over any conversation that has you be under something. So under capitalized, mm -hmm. under represented, under resourced, right? Mm -hmm. We have a tendency, especially in POC communities, especially um, when you're serving a specific neighborhood or community that you get labeled with and sometimes resources come from that, being underprivileged. Mm -hmm. Get over being under, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first step of mm -hmm. radical imagination. Imagine your identity created from your own kind of connection and your own urgency to be your ancestor's wildest dream. So mm -hmm. that's the first part. Just get over being under. And, the imagine, and, and when you can take that leap, Right? Mm -hmm. When you take that leap of, to your point, uh, this time travel, this astro projection mm -hmm. into what a black future, this season at MBT, we're calling it Black to the Future, what is possible? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. The audacity, the mm -hmm. radicalness of what is possible when not, you're under nothing. And so for me, that is the cornerstone of how we produce and why we've been on the corner of 125th Street and 5th Avenue for a half a century. Mm -hmm. We didn't luck up on it, you know? Mm -hmm. It was radical mm -hmm. in our imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, jumping on, on that point, and thank you all for sharing um, those ideas. Um, one thing that's interesting about this word, radical, which, mm -hmm. you know, can, can scare and can excite, um, but if, we, if you look at the epistemology of the word, mm -hmm. it comes from the word roots. Yes. Um, and so connected to this idea is both the idea of getting to the core, what's at the core of the issue, mm -hmm. but also it, it, it links us to this idea of being grounded. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of you, just in your last response, kind of naturally gravitated to, to what, what this actually means in terms of a community, a, ge a geography. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you can, um, talk with us a little bit about this idea of um, being embodied, being grounded, holding space, um, and how that uh, connects to the work you do. I'll say very quickly, so um, it was funny, I was doing a panel at the Apollo and some very wealthy white man came on before us um, uh, to talk to us about our community, it was awesome. And he said, I don't know, I was like, it was Thelma, Golden, myself, and Janelle Perko from the Apollo. And she said, you know, he said, and it's so wonderful that you guys have made it, mm. that, you know, you, you're here for this moment as if 
it was accidental. Mm -hmm. Right? Like this, we lucked up on our property. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not ha how it works, right? We all know that. And so the rootedness, um, the National Black Theater started in 1968 by my mother, Dr. Barbara Ann Tier. Uh, we started in the same building, an old jewelry factory, studio museum, and National mm -hmm. Black Theater under the same roof. Mm -hmm. in <laughs> and we're both turning 50, right? S something was happening in 68. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A lot of things. In 1983, the building in which we were both housed in uh, burned to the ground. Uh, it was a six alarm fire. Uh, the commercial real estate uh, one space, which uh, was a Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the next space was a dry cleaner. And the explosion from the grease and the chemicals created the building to uh, come down. So, rooted. We show up the next day and we're all homeless, right? Um, and my mother said in 1983, crack has officially hit our communities. Everything in Harlem looks bombed out. She was like, I wanna buy the property. People were like, you are crazy. And she was like, no, it's the most famous address in the world. And people are looking at this Kentucky Fried Chicken that burned to the ground in an old jewelry factory where you're, you're like doing rituals and painting and people couldn't see. Point is, she said, you could go anywhere in the world and say Fifth Avenue, and everybody immediately knows New York City and opulence, breakfast at Tiffany's, Fifth Avenue. You say 125th Street, you know we're talking about Harlem, we're talking about black culture, and we're talking about that cultural corridor. She said, I wanted to own the corner of the two that intercede and build a temple to the excellence and the beauty of our authentic story and power. So, be Ooh. rooted. <laughs> while projecting what is possible, because now, you know, 125th Street is fancy. It wasn't then. And so the point is holding space for what's possible mm -hmm. next mm -hmm. and watering that every single day like your life depends on it and your community's life depends on it because you know what? It does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> God bless National Black Theater. Yeah, Woo! Right. I got goosebumps. Chills. Chills. I think it's, it's, it's really, for me, um, this concept of rootedness and the radical is really about legacy and what we know about where we come from. And as a person who moves around the country, I'm from Houston, Texas. I've been in New York for 10 years. I lived in North Carolina, I lived in DC. So I've been moving for work, for love, for education since I was a kid, basically. And what I, I think what's kept me rooted and my practice rooted is having a, very, a, a real critical sense of family, of accountability, of, of chosen family, and of blood family, and of, of accountability to the communities that I've been a part of. Just because I've transitioned out of them doesn't mean I forget about people or forget about what they've taught me. I think it's also important to honor your teachers, honor your master teachers, honor the people who have invested in you as a way of staying rooted in practice and rooted in an understanding of being a bridge to the next person and the next person. So for me, rootedness is, a, is, it is about place. Even though I'm not from Harlem in particular, Harlem is a cultural mecca that black artists have gone to and wanted to be in since the beginning of Harlem. And so it's really important, again, in talking about cultural <coughs> rootedness, to know who's put in the work, who's guided you, who's made it possible for you to walk, march up and down 125th Street today, talking about, you know, free, free us, freedom now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like, for me, um, the concept of, of being rooted and the radical is it, it's becoming increasingly important um, as our communities shift, as we experience what it means to be experiencing gentrification, um, as our community, as people leave and move further away with the digital kind of world that we're in right now, to know who you are, where you are, where you're from, why you're there, what helps you to get there, and what's important to help this, these communities to thrive. I think it's intimately, for me, a ritual practice. And, 
Sade mentioned ritual. I think we're all talking about ritual. Ritual is what you do. It's what you do every day. And the idea of ritual being something that's about talking to your neighbor. You know, if, they're, if, the, if the children on, on your corner need something, it's not, it doesn't have to be these grand gestures, how you welcome people, how you really pay attention to the needs of your community or the need, your needs of your family, needs of your household. Very intimate encounters, I think for me, is what, what is really informing my ideas of what to, how to be rooted and how to be radical to be intimately involved with people and not to just see people as pass-bys or, or a step ladders to get to the next thing or the next idea that you want to accomplish. Coming home to self, coming home to what you've been taught, coming home to legacy is, uh, yeah, it's what's really standing out for me right now. <laughs> um. Yes, uh, the Laundromat Project has worked uh, very intimately with uh, Ms. Golden here over the last uh, five years. She works with us as a cultural organizing uh, consultant and guru. So lots of what I'll say might resonate with what you just heard. Um, and uh, when we were discussing this earlier, um, some of these ideas around rootedness and holding space, I was thinking a lot about units of time, which you've both brought up. So, 50 years for NBT, Studio Museum, um, so five decades, five hours that um, mm -hmm. I went on a journey with uh, Ebony and a group of uh, just beautiful uh, people across uh, 125th Street. I'd never been to First Avenue on 125th Street. And then um, the Laundromat Project, we're 12 years old and we've been uh, very much rooted in New York City, so also uni units of time as well as scale. Um, kind of how do these things kind of fit together? Um, and in the last five years, we have anchored ourselves in three neighborhoods, um, which is a deliberate choice. Um, they are Bed-Stuy, Harlem, and Hunts Point Longwood in the South Bronx. And the motivation around that was about issues of sweat equity, accountability, reciprocity, and this factor of time and rootedness. What does it mean to come back again and again? We do, we work in a variety of ways, but one of the key ways we work is we commission artists and residents over a six month period in each of those neighborhoods and occasionally others as well. But so that, those are smaller units of time that are six months. Um, often those artists end up doing things and being feeling committed and you don't leave just because you've left or because the thing has officially ended. Um, but also as an organization, we wanted to be able to say, we're, we're here, we remain, we care, we will listen, we will show up for the event, we will talk to the kids, we will learn the names, um, we will say hello, um, we will help when it's needed and we will ask for help when we need it because we don't assume that that's only happening in one direction. We will be held accountable when we don't live up to our best selves and we will ask questions when we need to figure out what's going on. So all of that relates to a certain level of rootedness in the sense that you act differently. You, if you know that you will be held to account and if you know that you will be returning, it's a different way that you move in the world with a certain level of intentionality and care, and that again, that sense of let us figure out, we want to be well and we want to be well together. And uh, for communities of color, for people of color, so yes, there's a geography mm -hmm. of uh, that, particularly that the LP works in and uh, that has come up here, but the LP also works with a community of artists. They're 150 strong over that 12 years that we've worked with uh, through our signature program, and that's a community that we care about and return to and work with. And, have that sense of rootedness and reciprocity in one another. It is about building family. Mm -hmm. it, is. it is about building community. Can I yeah. say one quick thing? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the second part of that question was about holding space. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's something that these women up here do maybe better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think we'd be remiss if we didn't just touch on that for a hot second. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I would say is on my hardest day, mm -hmm. um, MBT, we do something called uh, holistic producing. So we use our plays as, co as conversation pieces. So we curate a dramaturgical lobby exhibit where we tease out a social justice message. You see that, you go in, you see the play, and then we have a talk back at the end. And, you know, I run 
a multi-million dollar cultural arts organization. We're constantly raising money, constantly doing all these things that you would yawn about. But my hardest moment in my work and in my practice is that talk back. Because the amount of space you have to hold mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for everyone to be heard, seen, nurtured, um, for their pain mm -hmm. to feel sacred. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest job. And I know in all of our different practices, the holding of space, especially in the communities in which we work, mm -hmm. is the, the most challenging and the most invisible. And that is a part of the alchemy of how I think alchemy. we can um, and we do um, uh, the, the impact of the work that we do is the holding space part. I want to talk about yeah. this too. Yeah. <laughs> because I think people, thank you for, yes, thank for bringing you. this back up because I, I'd forgotten that part. I think oftentimes, and in, in a big part of the work that I do, folks come to me with a question or a problem that isn't easy to solve. Right. And so oftentimes in terms of, especially when I'm working with artists and I'm oftentimes working with artists who haven't received the type of training or the type of apprenticeship or mentorship that would come from folks like us up here, right? So how do you find yourself? How do you find yourself in a world where you know a lot of what you wanna know isn't valued? And how do you hold space for people when you know that they are having a, they're having a transformative experience that they may not understand for yes. the next 40 years. Yes. So this goes back to radical imagination mm -hmm. and, it is a, and it is a strategy mm -hmm. to push into those spaces and to hold people in those spaces and to conjure wellness for people in those spaces as they're doing the, unne the necessary work of decolonizing themselves. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, this is the emotional labor that's come up, that's been coming up a lot lately. This is, the, this is the ritual work that we can't really, you can't find it in a book. There's no blueprint, there's no recipe. There's only attunement that can help folks really, really get there. You know, attunement, alignment with self and with legacy that can really help people to get there. And, and then we have to talk about how do we take care of ourselves in the midst of doing all of this holding space for other people, which oftentimes is the last thing on the to-do list that is a mile long. Are you well? Not are you well, am I well? Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that actually, I want to jump in there with, with something that I think is infused in everything that I'm hearing come up here, which is the role of black women. And I don't think it's an accident that we have three powerhouse black women here on stage four. Um, <laughs> but, and also, you know, and the fact that um, each of you is making a connection between the work that you've been put on this earth to continue, but you're also interested in recognizing a link mm. always. To, always. To, always. to the shoulders of those that you're standing on top of. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we could, um, uh, take a moment to think about um, and to explore this idea of those shoulders that mm -hmm. we're standing on, on, on top of and what has been historically the role of black and brown women in infusing, remembering the power of everyday creativity in communities. Well, I don't know anything without my teachers. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, this is what I was just talking about in terms of mentorship and one mentorship and apprenticeship. I don't do anything new. Everything that I do, even what I'm saying right now, is because someone decided that I was important enough to, to teach. And this is, a, this is a major thing, I think, you know, in terms of the work that we do, the professionalization of these rooted ways of being in the world. We have to remember the root. And it's important, if we don't remember that, then it becomes just kind of, I don't, I, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's not as powerful. It's not as powerful. For me, doing the work in the name of my mother, my, my organization yeah. is Betty's Daughter Arts Collaborative, and I'll never change the name of it. Uh, Betty's Daughter, I am Betty's Daughter. What I do as Betty's Daughter Arts Collaborative, I am doing my mother's work. My mother's retired now and I'm continuing her legacy, and I don't really make a lot of moves that she doesn't agree with. She, you may not know it if you, you know, it may look like I made the decision, but I, 
I'm working inside of a framework. I'm working inside of, of a lineage and a legacy mm -hmm. that is, is and, and that I think it's really important to understand where you come from, you know, and, and I, keep, I can keep saying this over and over again. It's so important to me. Um, and it's important, I think, that we lift up names and we, and we honor and we build lives that are monuments to the people who have, the black women, the brown women, the folks who have made sure that we could sit here on the stage and look shiny on a Friday. You know, it's very important. It's very important. And I feel like um, on my best day, I am basically, you know, at, at the root, I am giving what my teachers have given to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, this is, and this is often, you know, when I speak, and we, don't, we didn't have the time to do it, I go through and I list 15 people. I am doing this because of this person and this person and this person and this person. And, you know, it's important. It's important. Um, and I, I, I really lift that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so ancestry, being powered by our ancestors, that's one of the things has been my meditation. Mm. I mean, always. I run an organization that my mother uh, started, right? But if I could bring it full circle, being rooted, holding space, where we're located on 125th and 5th Avenue, which is why every time I see images of 125th and Freedom, I get goosebumps. So 125th Street, if no one knows, we built our first new building. We're in the middle of a capital uh, project for our next building. but. Um, is on the corner of 125th Street. And what no one knows about construction on 125th Street is very complicated. Hmm. Why? Because there's a river. A river. That runs from the East River all the way to the West Side. Mm -hmm. It has a tide. It has a rhythm. Yeah. It has a beat. Now, let's get deeper with it. How, why 125th Street, what was that channel doing? The Native Americans use that channel to get from one side to the next side. That is running underneath mm -hmm. everything that we do. I mm. would be remiss on the best day when I'm fucking brilliant. <laughs> I am a divine listener. Mm -hmm. And it's that river that talks to us, right? Mm -hmm. It's that river that tells you when the tide is high and when the tide is low, and you always have to be respectful. You, so you have yeah. these people pouring millions and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars into their construction. Most of it is going to, how the fuck is the basement not gonna flood when the tide comes up? So <laughs> our ancestors are always <laughs> talking and communicating to us. Our and nature ancestors, our plant ancestors, all of them. our all of them. river ancestors. Yes. Yes. Well, and so what we get to do, we have the privilege mm -hmm. of being able to listen mm -hmm. and not be, not be oppressed by some of our blood memory, but mm. be expressed by our blood memory. And so for me and the work that we do at MBT, it is all about feeding that rhythm, that mm. river, mm. and asking for the benevolence to be kind enough um, to wake up another day to be able to serve. And the last thing I'll say about being a black woman is we as women of color, black women, and I really wanna say this in this room, in this day and age, right now, today, build your village. Mm -hmm. Build your village, feed your village. I keep cursing, My mother, I, I know better. <laughs> Stop building your brand, build your village. It's the only yes. Yes. Yeah. And she said, you know, I hate when people say that's off brand. I want to be, I want to tell people, get on team. Get mm. on team. And I'm like, mm. yes, on team. <laughs> on the team. The extension of that is mm. really, we have worked so hard generation after generation after generation not to be branded. So everybody walking around talking about, it's not my brand, this brand, that brand. <laughs> Build come your on, come on, Shadi. Screw your brand. It will come. Yes. 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 And that's what black women have been doing. Yes. That's At the right. kitchen it's table, yes. on the front porch, in the for garden, centuries. in the church basement, for centuries, building village, forgetting about not, not, well, yeah. 
F in the brand. F in the brand. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you want to jump in there. One of the things that I find so interesting, just like conceptually about the laundromat project, is this idea of like the laundromat, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, and just connecting back to this idea of the everyday, and yep. can we take a moment to infuse and remember the power possible in the everyday? Um, can, you, can you jump in there maybe around this, this thread of, Black women, uh -huh, uh -huh, radical uh -huh. creativity, mm -hmm. in the everyday, and who are the people who are instigating and, re and reminding us of the power at that location? Mm. Absolutely. So first of all, I have to shout out Risa Wilson, who's the founder of the Laundromat Project, a black woman, mm -hmm. and, um, and started nurturing this idea in the late 90s, and here we are. Um, and the idea from that very beginning was this idea of being rooted in community, being rooted in the places like she grew up in, Philadelphia, a black community in Philadelphia, but um, eventually really birthing the Laundromat Project in Bed-Stuy, um, a historically black neighborhood. Um, that is changing, and what does that mean, and who is holding down the conversation and the, and the fight to figure out how to hold on to that place and to hold on to the meaning of that place are often black women that are at those meetings, at those community events. Um, and in... Uh, as we were having this, as I was listening to this amazing conversation, build your village, build, find, where's your team, all of those amazing things, I can't help but think about the women in uh, Hunts Point and in Longwood, where again, we've had this apartment for about three years as an organization. Um, so laundromat has really expanded to be the uh, metaphor. So laundromats were originally the focus because those are places where in a city like New York, where we all have to do our laundry and we don't have them in our apartments typically, is a place where different generations meet, different genders meet, people of different races, et cetera. It's very much across a path uh, that different people cross but don't necessarily speak to one another. So how, how could art and creativity be infused in this place that ha in a space that has people literally waiting? I'm waiting for the cycle, you know, the spin cycle, the whatever cycle to, to, to happen, and I'm just sitting and trying to figure out what to do. Well, you're surrounded by people. You're surrounded by your neighbors in that moment. So having a film festival in a laundromat or having a photo uh, session or telling and collecting stories of immigrants um, was one of the ways or some of the kinds of projects that we've done over that time. Um, and the idea was to help turn strangers into neighbors. But we've since expanded uh, by listening to artists. Uh, sometimes the laundromat itself was too limiting to, or not the exact right, literally physical environment that people need to do their projects. So they happen on sidewalks now. They happen in, in community gardens. They happen um, in parks libraries, wherever it makes sense that there's kind of a community gathered. Um, and it is about uh, saying that people's ideas, their imaginations, what they care about, what they can make, it's not about expertise for us. We're working with amazing artists, but we're often saying to people, your creativity is what it is, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to mean that you can draw someone that looks exactly like the thing you're looking at. In fact, you should do something different. That, What is it that you can bring of yourself to this moment? How can we say that what you, what you think and what you care about and what you can imagine um, is both radical and valued, mm -hmm. is very much at the source of what we're trying to communicate. Like, it matters that you can think about something other than survival, mm -hmm. uh, which is so key and so necessary and so front of mind. But we have to move past and through survival to something better and different and radical. And it is through infusing arts creativity, holding up artists as one, value, one valued member of a community, and all the things that they bring is kind of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you all. We're out of time.